explain for us how you can join if you are watching this or how you can comment. Yes, um, so there are multiple ways to watch this, um, whether it's um, through the WebEx link or through uh, YouTube. Um, if you are watching this and um, you would like to participate in the meeting, um, there is multiple ways to do that. If you are logged into the WebEx, um, you'll be able to speak to us um, when it's your time and turn, and I'll show you how to indicate that in just a moment. If you're not, um, or if you have any trouble attempting to speak, or there's any sort of issues with your microphone or connection, you can always send emails to the email address on the bottom. It's planning.commons at slcgov.com. Um, and we will be monitoring that throughout the meeting. Any comments we get about um, a topic uh, that happens to receive it before the public hearing, we will read it during that public hearing. If we receive them after the public hearing, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to share them during the meeting. Um, Marlene, can you go to the second page of the slide? So in order to participate, um, there's a little hand in the bottom right hand of the corner, and it is small and it's easy to miss it. But when it comes time for your item and we're discussing that item, and if you would like to speak, uh, just click on that button, indicate that, and that will show to us that you're interested in um, speaking. You should be able to look at your own name and see that their little hand is raised. Um, once you're done speaking and you don't have, you would not like to speak on further uh, matters, it would be helpful for us if you could um, click the button once again so that it disappears and lets us know that you're not looking to uh, speak to the um, rest of this meeting. Um, again, if you have any issues, please feel free to email us planning.comments at slcgov.com. I think at this time, Marlene, we can um, take that off the screen. We can get started. Okay, uh, I do not think that we need to read the anchor location uh, announcement today, um, but we will not be meeting in an anchor location. Obviously, we will be meeting only online today. Um, so I uh, have, I'm going to be asking for an approval of the minutes for January, um, January 10th, excuse me, not January, but yeah, not January 10th, February February 10th, sorry. Madam Chair, I move that the minutes be approved for February 10th, 2021. Do I have a second? I have a second. I have a motion from Carolyn and a second from John uh, to approve the minutes. So I'm going to go through a roll call vote here, and this will be um, Maureen. Yes. Amy. Sorry, yes. Adrian? Abstain. Carolyn? Yes. John? Yes. Matt? Yes. Sarah? Abstain. And is Crystal here this evening? She is not. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, the minutes are approved. Um, now, uh, moving on to uh, the report of the chair and the vice chair, I have no report. Amy? I have nothing as well. Thank you. And the report of the director? I, I don't have anything to share at this time. Okay, thank you. So we'll move right along. We're going to start uh, uh, the set of public hearings that we have for this evening. And the first one is modifications to Izzy South design review at approximately 534 East 2100 South. It's case number PLN PCM 2020-00222. And it's presented by Caitlin Miller. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. I'm happy to be here with you this evening. Hey, Caitlin, can I interrupt you just for oh, a moment? Sorry. I just wanted to let the, your presenter group know um, I was able to make Ian, Percy, and Max Korath um, a panelist. I have not been able to make Ryan McMullen or Ian Percy into a panelist. I can unmute them during their time, but they wouldn't be able to share their screen. And so what they may want to do is during this time to maybe exit and try and re-enter the meeting. Um, and maybe to send that presentation to somebody like um, Justin, who was able to make it into the meeting. So 
I just want to give them some time. Thank you for that, John. Marlene, if I could have presentation privileges, please. Thank you so much. Is everyone able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Thank you very much. All right, so this is for the Izzy South development that is located at 534 East, 2100 South. And just for a little bit of background information on this project, um, this proposal has already gone through a design review and special exception approval processes with the Planning Commission. The project has already been approved. It was approved by the Planning Commission in their December 2nd, 2020 meeting, where the Planning Commission found that it met all of the standards um, set forth in the ordinance, which includes building size, building height, parking, number of units, um, all of those things. So the only thing that the Planning Commission will be considering for this development this evening is the requested change to the exterior materials. So the applicants have requested a materials change from the approved wood lap siding to a proposed metal paneling and EIFS, as can be seen in the renderings here. These material changes will also be reflected in the southern facade of the building where um, a portion of the wood building will be replaced with the EIFS. Here is another view of that same face of the building. And just for the Planning Commission's um, information, we have a table here on the screen that indicates the change materials, um, both for the metal paneling and the EIF. So the only material that would be removed and replaced would be that wooden siding, the existing approved metal siding would not be replaced. It would just be portions of the um, wooden siding. So this concludes staff's presentation. I am more than happy to answer any questions that you may have or turn the time over to our applicants to address any questions as well. Unless the planning commissioners have questions, let's move to the applicant. Thank you, Caitlin. This is Justin. Can I share my screen and I'll just do a short uh, slide deck? You should have it now. Okay, thanks. Okay, let me know when that comes up. We have it now, Justin. Okay, thank you. So uh, I am Justin Hepler with AJC Architects. I um, am representing um, High Boy Ventures on uh, presenting this project. Um, thank you uh, both to the Planning Commission and to Caitlin uh, for um, the time tonight and for the effort uh, that we put into this. Uh, what we are doing is asking for a materiality change that we believe helps uh, add some additional dimensional quality to the facade. One of the things we heard when we were uh, presenting this um, a few months ago to the public is that they felt like it may be a little bit too monolithic. Um, as we've been developing the north building across the street, uh, we played around with the idea of uh, changing the color and materiality of the portion on the third floor that pushes back um, along uh, 2100 South and liked um, the architectural quality it brought to the building. We were trying to be very simple in our material choices when we designed this project, uh, maybe too simple. Um, and so by adding that dimensional quality of pushing back and not repeating the uh, flatboard siding up on the third floor, it helps uh, the townhouse elements pop out more and it helps, we believe, accentuate those in a positive way, um, making uh, the uh, architectural facades have more character. 
and uh, helping to create that dimensional pushback on the third floor. So we thought it was worth coming back and asking if we could do that on the um, south facade. We reached out to Molly, um, understood that this would be part of that process. The other thing we are asking for on the south or on the north facade of the south building is uh, to take that metal panel that is on the pop out element of the townhouse uh, gable forms and push it around the corner. We believe that makes that less busy and results in a simpler presentation um, that expresses the architecture uh, more successfully. Um, so that would be on the north facade of the south building. Then as we uh, rotate, so this is an overall view and you see that pushed back from above with the different material color and texture um, with the EFIS product instead of the siding. Um, moving to the south facade of the south building, um, we thought that also helped uh, pop the three wood elements that were already designed to pop out. If we took the um, facade of the pushed back elements and uh, changed those to the EFIS with the uh, with the gray color tone. Um, and so we felt like it helped add dimensional character to the back of the building also. Um, so uh, be, for those reasons, we thought it was worth coming back and asking if we could have the council's permission to, or the commission's per permission to make these adjustments as we move towards the end of construction documents and get ready to um, wrap this up and submit it to the city. Um, so that's my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions about the logic of why we're proposing this and, and uh, Hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys agree that we are enhancing the building. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Does the commission have any questions for the applicant or for staff? Okay, so hearing none, I'm going to move on to the public hearing. Open up the public hearing. Is anyone from the community council here? Yes, we do have uh, Judy Short here. Um, Judy, I can I will mute you and please feel free to share your thoughts. Thank you very much. In looking at the drawings, there doesn't seem to be a huge visible change in the look of the building, except that it's darker. It seems that the change from wood and metal to IFAS and metal does not seem to be a good option. IFAS is a less durable material than wood and softer than stucco. The purpose of design review is to get a better result. We don't think this change will do that. We recommend you go with the original materials. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Are there any other um, people wishing to speak? Um, we do have several, um, and I'll call on them just as a reminder if people showed up late, if you'd like to speak. Please make sure to indicate so by clicking on the little hand on the bottom right hand side quarter of your screen so we know who to call on. Um, so and also, if you if you will also state your name and uh, you will have two minutes to talk. Yes, thank you for that. Um, commissioners, we have Devin O'Donnell who would like to speak. Devin, would you like to share your comments? Uh, yes, I would, absolutely. I apologize for the beeping. I just walked into a room and have to yeah, that's fine. Do my alarm. Um, so I'm a now I am aware that this project has been approved and this may not be the correct venue for this, but in general, I just had some comments for the development you should see. Um, as a Salt Lake City resident for 15 years, I have been well, frequently bothered by the amount of high priced housing that has come up and the lack of low income housing. I'm grateful to live next to Project Open that does provide low income housing. But in 10 years, every time an apartment went up, myself and my friends were unable to afford it. And we make $15 an hour, what is supposed to be the federal minimum wage. Um, $1,200 for a studio apartment um, seems excessive. So I would just ask the development agency and maybe if anyone on the city council is on this, to consider that when approving projects moving forward, that you are pushing people out of the city to bring in money from out of state, which is also inc increasing our homeless problem, which I also live next to and see the people on the street and watch the camps grow. So again, yes, just asking you all to consider that as you approve projects moving forward to help keep Salt Lake residents in Salt Lake. Thank you.
Um, it looks like our next speaker is going to be Eli Kaufman. Um, Eli Kaufman, you are unmuted. If you'd like to speak, you have two minutes to do so. All right, great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Well, I've been a resident of our sugar house my whole life. I grew up in this neighborhood um, and I grew up in Salt Lake um, and I agree with what Devin has said. I think that um, even though this project has already been approved, I would have liked to be able to comment on it sooner, but it's been very difficult to figure out how and where I can engage in these meetings because the city council website is not welcoming and makes it very difficult to register, makes it difficult to know which um, which issues will be discussed at each um, at each meeting. And I just want to say that like most of the people I know in Salt Lake can afford apartments that are around half of what um, apartments like this cost. Um, and I really think that it's out of touch for everyone to be focusing entirely on these minor design changes, which as an artist seem very um, irrelevant and minuscule and focusing a lot more on who's actually going to live in these because I've seen plenty of luxury apartment buildings go up um, all over all over town and they're almost all empty because nobody in Salt Lake can afford them. I just want to say that as a part of Wasatch Tenants United, I disagree with um, building any of these projects, but um, especially this one, it just seems out of touch to be building townhomes for people who can't afford them. Um, they should be priced much lower. They should be considering the income of the average Salt Lake City person. We should be considering the fact that the minimum wage in Salt Lake is much lower than federal minimum wage. I mean, a lot of people uh, supposedly living wage in Salt Lake is around $11, but a lot of people I know make a, a lot less than that, like $11 an hour. And so considering that, I don't know how any of us are supposed to consider all of these new buildings that you guys are approving for people like us like sure they might look nice but who are they for because they're not for salt lake city residents and i think that it's important that in the future you guys keep that in mind but also moving forward with projects that have already been approved how can that be changed or how can that be modified so that it can more be more welcome to people who are actually working and living in this city because if you keep approving all these projects that are for people who aren't from here and who aren't working these working class jobs, there's not going to be anybody left in Salt Lake to clean your toilets and serve your food because thank, we won't thank be you. here. Anymore. Uh, thank you, ma'am. We, we, uh, you, your time is up. Thank you very much for your comment. It looks like um, our next uh, individual would like to speak. I believe it's uh, Ian Dexter, or I'm not exactly sure I'm saying your first name right, but um, you have two minutes, so go ahead, sir. Or can you hear me? Yes. Yes, cool. we can hear you. Um, yeah, so my name is Ian. I'm with Wasatch Tennis United as well. Um, I Ian, think what's, I what's your last name, please? Daxter, D-A-X-T-E-R. Thank you. Go ahead. Cool. Um, I currently live in Sugar House. I've been living in Salt Lake City my entire life. Um, I've watched and like felt in the world and like my life around me as the rent has gone up. Um, as these huge, fairly ugly, fairly ridiculous apartments, like, and I say, and I mentioned this, like, as far as we're talking about the aesthetics, this is not good. And I wouldn't really care if this was serving a purpose, but all it's going to do is sit empty because no one in the city can afford this project. Like, people aren't going to be able to afford to live here. I think that it's pretty morally bankrupt for the city government, for any city board to be zoning and approving projects on behalf of these developers at the expense of the actual people who live in these neighborhoods. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, it looks like our next uh, individual will be Soren Simonson. Soren, you've been unmuted. You go ahead if you'd like. Thank you. And I actually have a quick question, maybe for staff or the chair before my comments. And that is, is there a public comment period uh, on this agenda? This is the there, public comments. You're with it. You're in. You're doing it. Okay. I've so, got a. I've got a general comment, not specific. To oh, the you mean no? We don't. We don't have a general comment period in planning commission meetings. We have comments only on specific projects. Public okay. Projects then, projects. then I will try and make a general comment as part of this item and the next one on the agenda. Um, I, I'm not representing the Sugar House Community Council. Judy spoke very well. I, I am concerned a little bit, of, as she mentioned, about the use of EFIS. I, I think it's uh, 
uh, mm -hmm. lower quality and less durable material than what was part of this proposal. And I think the wood, at least in my opinion, would be more consistent with uh, the encouragement in numerous planning documents to use durable materials. And so I would encourage consideration to use wood or some other more durable material uh, like a panel, hardy panel siding or something like that, rather than uh, EFIS. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this item? I believe we have one more. Um, Michelle Moore, it looks like you've indicated you'd like to speak. Um, you can go ahead and do that now. Hi, my name is Michelle Maurer. Um, I am with Wasatch Tenants United, and I'm just, as a Salt Lake City taxpayer, I am just here to voice my disappointment and um, my discouragement in the rezoning of this area. Um, as it's been said, there is a lot of unaffordable housing that continues to uh, pop up and it's really it's really discouraging to see to see people who have to you know they get evicted from their homes because salt lake wants to bring in money and push out people who have lived here their entire lives um and i know like so i just had a friend today who got an eviction notice and she's lived in salt lake her whole life and, um, you know, so these tech bros can, they like bought the place. And so now she's being kicked out of her home. And I know that's not directly, it's not directly, you know, this lot obviously, but it is tied. We do not want us, our neighbors, our family, our friends to be kicked out of Salt Lake because we can't afford it. It's pretty transparent what's going on here the attraction of outside money and the destruction of old, amazing things that are, you know, home to Salt Lake, to see them being torn down and to see these, uh, these unaffordable condominiums, et cetera, go up. It's really frustrating. Um, I think that this is a really harmful practice and you are directly harming people in Salt Lake. And um, as someone said before, too, it is also directly tied to um, the unsheltered, the, all the people who don't have homes. It's really, really wild. And I know y'all aren't like, you don't, you know, you're not, you're not Chief Police Mike Brown, but to see cops harass and sheltered people who are camping outside of condominiums that are empty, that are huge, just the juxtaposition of that is awful. And y'all are directly. Here, that's two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Um, I don't have any new hands. Um, those who have speaking, if you would. Um... There is uh, Paula Mendoza. Oh, thank you. I missed that. Thank you. Um, Paula, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Paula Mendoza. I'm a member of the organization Wasatch Tenants United, and I'm here to voice my opposition to this rezoning development, even though uh, it's past the point of um, being canceled. Um, I just want to say I'm a graduate student and a professor at the University of Utah, and I know firsthand as a student, as well as through the experiences of the students I teach, that affordable housing is absolutely necessary to academic and professional success. This rezone only benefits developers looking out for their bottom line and does not take into consideration the communities directly affected in this area. These developments will no longer go unnoticed. They displace and destabilize the community by making housing debilitatingly expensive for families and individuals to afford to live. Thank you. Thank you. If that is all the, um, if we received any emails on this? We have received a number of emails. Um, a couple of which have been placed in your Dropbox as they were received uh, earlier in the day or within the last 24 or 48 hours. Um, <clears throat> there is one from 
uh, a constituent named Wanda and another from uh, David Fernandez. They are both in your Dropbox and I direct your attention to those. Uh, and then I have a few more, uh, let's see. I have at least one more to read into the record. Okay, please go ahead. So this one is from Lynn Schwartz uh, for the Planning Commission. This is a classic bait and switch by the developer. The original design approval was for specific materials, giving the building a specific appearance. Almost as soon as design approval was given, the developer asked to use cheaper materials. Less durable and cheaper ethos do not lead to better lead to sorry do not lead to a better project. This change will lead to a building that screams, "quote This looks like a builder who used the cheapest stuff as possible." End quote. The clear intent of the design review process is to have high quality buildings that will last. This materials swap does not meet that standard. Um, I'm sorry, who was that, Molly? That was from Lynn Schwartz. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I think that's it on. Um, I think that's it on the emails to read and to the record. As I said, there's been a couple other that have been placed in your Dropbox, so you have the written record of those ones. All right. Thank you. There being no other comments, I'm going to go ahead and bring this back to the commission for discussion. Uh, also, uh, I'm going to ask if the um, if the applicant would like to address the comments from uh, from 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 public. So I'll just say a, a few brief things. Um, thank you for everyone's comments. Uh, at, in this material change uh, it, regarding the durability, uh, the product is all up high on the third floor. Uh, it definitely is, uh, all the uh, materials proposed originally are all down on the street. We um, stayed uh, loyal to that and we don't think that adding any uh, of the EFIS product down low would do anything to the building to enhance the architecture. And again, we're not looking to, um, it's, it's kind of sixes in the swap. So we're just looking to, in, in our minds, enhance the architecture of the building. Um, so uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Commissioners, does anybody hey. have any comments or discussion? Um, I do. Um, so first, I just wanted to kind of address some of the comments that were made. Um, I definitely, you know, feel the the frustration um, and the passion that those comments were made with, you know, under. Um, for me, you know, if we were to stop all development in Salt Lake City, we're in the middle of a huge housing shortage. That's just going to continue to raise the price on every house in Salt Lake City. The purpose of these types of densification projects um, is not necessarily to replace um, single family homes with affordable housing, it's to provide housing for more people, which will then in turn create more affordable housing throughout the city, um, just due to the fact that we don't have enough housing. And so that's going to push the price up like just like anything else. Um, and th this is a way of solving that problem, the more dense we can build. Um, it may not be affordable to everyone in that specific development, but overall, it should bring down pr housing costs throughout the city. And that's really what the purpose of these projects are. And I just kind of wanted to get that out there to kind of clarify. I mean, I, the more housing there is, obviously, the cheaper and more affordable the rest will be. So, um, and then to kind of bring it back to the topic, um, I would agree with the changes to the front of the facades where we're turning the corner with materials. Anytime we can do that, um, I think it just makes the building look more um, complete. Um, when you add, you know, a material change at a corner, it typically makes the building feel unfinished and um, can kind of cheapen the look. I feel like this really accentuates the architecture in a better, cleaner way, and it still is a durable material. Um, I would also, I would, I would then go to the EFIS portion of this, which I'm 
vary against EFIS in any form. Um, I, I agree that on the third floor it's more acceptable, but it is difficult to approve with um, the, the porches and balconies up there where there's going to be furniture that may punch holes in the EFIS. I think a stucco would even be better, but if we could do a cement board, um, I would ask Justin that question. Is there a way to do a cement board on this? So we could go with a panelized cement board, yes. Um, we think it makes sense to have a, a less busy material up on top, which is why we uh, kind of landed at EFIS. We could do EFIS or stucco, um, but if you were open to a panelized cement board, we also could look at that um, as, as an alternate option. So, okay. uh, what we would like it. We would like direction in this meeting so we can wrap it, wrap up the design. <laughs> so, no, de de yeah. Definitely. I okay. I, I see where you guys broke up the facade in the ethos, and I think keeping that patterning with the cement board. I, you know, if if you did need to add a horizontal seam, just keep it low and maybe line it up with the bottom of the window, and that uh -huh. might be enough to get you the height. Um, I agree with the color change. I think it makes everything else pop with the wood, and I think it makes the entry more defined. I think there was way too much wood on the front, and so I, I agree 100% with your change for the design. I also okay. agree with it on the back. I think it breaks up the mass because um, there's a lot of mass all the way across the building, and I think this helps break up that, and I think it's an improvement. So as long Thank as you. we could use a durable material, I think we're all, you know, I'm, I'm happy with it. So. So I'm going to also agree with John on that, on both of those, both of those issues. You could also use the upper metal panel on that upper floor as well, uh, if you did. But I, but I kind of agree that cement board would actually be better. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Shear, if I could interrupt. Yeah. Um, um, Justin, I think one of the other your partners, Ryan McMullen, indicated to Molly that he might want to speak. He's in the attendee list, but for some reason the system won't always allow us to make the panelists. So I was going to yeah. unmute him. And he so, might be correcting something if I misspoke, so let him speak. So. Yeah, so, so Ryan McMullen, you are unmuted, and yeah. so you're able to uh, speak if you'd like. No, I'm good. Justin's got it covered, but I appreciate you looking out for me. Yeah. So. Okay, all right. Thank you. All right, so if there are no more comments from the commission, would anyone like to make a motion? John, you want to? See, I'm not sure if I can get access to my motion. To the so is the, is, is, the, is the proposed change that instead of EFIS, they use cement board? Is, yes, is that, the that, is the, that is the proposed change, <laughs> yes. Okay, and then I can make a motion. Thank you, Adrian. Based on the information in the staff report and the information presented, I move that the planning commission approve the requested modification to petition number PLN PCM 2020-00222 for Izzy South, located at approximately 534 East 2100 South with the following modification that the applicant replace um, the EFIS material with cement board in the location shown on the plans. I can second that. Thank you. I have a motion from Adrian and a second from John. Uh, Maureen? Yes. Amy? Uh, yes. Adrian? Yes. Carolyn? Agree. John? Yes. Matt? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Crystal? Yes. Okay, this is approved unanimously. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, so also we are now moving on to item number two of the agenda, which is the Snell Grove Ice Cream Factory property master plan and rezone at approximately 850 and 870 East 2100 South. And this is going to be presented. Um, let's see who has this. Who's doing this? I believe that is Lex Robber. Oh, Lex. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Lex. Um, let's see. 
Can you see my screen there? Yes, but it has a lot of gray squares, which. Uh, then that's not what you should be seeing. Hang on a second. No, no we're, we're looking we're, at the presenter. Yeah, presenter mode. We need to look at the regular mode. There you go. Is that up? Yes, that's good. Okay, now I can't see it, but. <laughs> you can't see your screen. <sighs> okay. Uh, this is a request for a um, master plan future land use map and zoning map amendment for two parcels located at approximately 850 and 870 East 21st South. And this is an anticipation of a mixed use type development um, uh, consisting of residential and commercial uses. The applicant is requesting to amend the future land use map in the future in the Sugar House Master Plan from mixed use low intensity to business district mixed use neighborhood scale and to change the zoning on the subject property from CC to CSHBD. Um, my presentation to you tonight is going to be short um, but precise. This is the location of the subject rezone and master plan amendment. It's the old Snell Grove ice cream factory um, parcel, along with the adjacent um, uh, office mini complex there to the east. Um, it's bordered by it's bordered on all sides by streets, which is slightly unusual. Um, it's on 21st South between 8th and 9th East and Commonwealth. Um, planning staff has provided you with an analysis of the proposal and the staff report, and we assert that the standards have been met for the proposed zoning map amendment. And we likewise assert that it is appropriate to amend the associated future land use map in the master plan. We recommend that you forward a positive recommendation regarding the proposed amendments onto the City Council for their consideration and action. So the question is, what are these amendments really about? And I want to distill these requests to the simplest terms possible. First off, the property is currently zoned and master plan for multifamily residential or mixed use type development. The use is allowed regardless of the outcome of the requested amendments will remain the same. Use is not the issue here. As I outlined in the staff report on page nine of, and that's of your PDF, um the 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 real question here is um is is about building height and the height of any structures built on the property in in the future and to much lesser extent building setbacks if you look at page nine talking about the cc zone and the chsbd2 zone both of those zones allow a building height of 30 feet by right um, anybody could, any developer could walk in, build a 30 foot structure by pull, pulling a building permit. There wouldn't be any sort of planning process involved. Um, if a planning process in, is involved, which would be the design review in the CC zone, which is the current zone, you, they could potentially build up to, to 45 feet. And if the zone is rezoned to the CHSBD2, they could potentially build up to 60 feet. So the crux of the request before you is whether or not to allow the opportunity for an additional 15 feet of building height if the applicant chooses to pursue a development through the design review process. Um, just, to have, just, just so you're aware, you're probably gonna hear public testimony momentarily regarding what can be built on the property in the future. You will probably hear concerns for traffic, parking, congestion, noise, dust, architectural styles, disrepair of the surrounding streets, lack of infrastructure, the need for affordable housing, no need for more luxury housing, no need for more retail, um, sidewalk widths, danger for drivers and pedestrians, crime, the list goes on. These are not the issues on the table tonight. 
please keep this in mind as the meeting progresses and please keep in mind the standards for making rezone and master plan amendment decisions as outlined in the staff report. I've received numerous emails today expressing concern, both positive and negative for the proposal before you tonight. Those emails have been placed in your Dropbox for your review. In conclusion, planning staff recommends that the planning commission forward a positive recommendation regarding the proposed amendments onto the city council for consideration. And that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to try to answer them for you. Uh, Mr. Trotter, I would like to make it clear to the, all of the attendees and anyone who is waiting to comment that we are very happy to entertain comments on any part of this proposal at this point. So, um, does, this, does the uh, commission, does the commission have any questions for staff? Yeah. Um, Max, I've got a question for you. So, in some ways we're taking the Sugar House Business District and it's extending down now past Ninth East, right? And, and I look at the broader zoning map and you have this you know, CC sort of zone, but then it goes to the form based SE and form based SC zones. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you could maybe talk about this rezone in a context of uh, those two zones, particularly height, use, and kind of, um, you know, intensity of what could, what, what could or maybe developed in an FB kind of SE zone. I mean, mainly I'm looking like in the master plan or the current zoning map, was there a vision that you have this? business district in Sugar House that would kind of phase its way out as it moves further kind of west to 21st South? Or, you know, is this CC lot, because it is kind of unique, the CC lot kind of sits there kind of sandwiched between the Sugar House Business District 2 and the FBSE with, it, you know, are we, are we zoned, you know, is this, because it sits there in this weird spot, is it, is that appropriate or not for that spot? I just want you to just talk to me in context of that. And, and you bring up a good point. It, the, the, they're, they're, there is meant to be a transition between the Sugar House Business District zone and the form based zone. And this parcel conglomeration of parcels is somewhat of an anomaly. It would be an extension of the Sugar House Business District zone. And the, the intent is to make a smoother transition between those two. I mean, because I read the zoning code, I mean, what, what are the height standards in? FBSE and FBSC. Off the top of my head, Matt, in this forum, I, I don't know. Um, Commissioner, while, while you were talking about it, I brought up the FB. FBSC actually allows um, its uh, maximum building height of 60 feet, but you can request 15 additional feet for residential uses if a minimum of 10% are affordable. And the SE is locked at 45 feet. Thanks for that, John. And so they're, they're, they're consistent and compatible. Okay. Right, Thank thanks. you. Um, do we have the applicant here? Yes. Good evening, kind of still getting used to these types of meetings. My name is Mark Isaac. I represent the ownership group on the Dryer Snell Grove project. Uh, some of you may recognize me. I've worked on a number of projects through the Sugar House area. Um, the interesting thing about this uh, application and this location is the adjacency of services on 9th East with the Smiths and the S-Line transit stop on 9th East uh, and some of the other accoutrements with the four-sided block, four-sided streets and stuff has allowed for um, real good layout, real good look, and real real good design iterations. Our idea was with the application is we could build up to 45 feet of height with planning commission and planning staff support in the original CC zone. We thought about going to the form-based code further to the west and, and extending that easterly or carrying the Sugar House Central Business District 2 zone further west. The idea with the Sugar House Central Business District zone further west was it was well received from the Sugar House Land Use Committee and the Sugar House Community Council. 
as a good uh, extension of the zone, the positive for the city and for the community of Sugar House, in our opinion, is there's more design criteria that we as the development team have to adhere to with the zoning change to the Sugar House Central Business District. We have all that design guidelines that are requirements of those um, zones and those conditions and they require the 15 foot setback uh, above first or second floor of height. They require a lot more material with regards to masonry, brick, uh, facades, and more of the commercial glass lines and stuff. So it's actually a little bit more expensive build type of requirements for the ownership, but we felt it was more in keeping with the intent of the community and the work of the planning staff and planning commission in the past in Sugar House was to maintain that image and that ambience down 2100 South. The give back or the idea was we've been watching the housing stock in our community. Market rate apartments are getting more and more expensive. Um, from our side, the land itself and then the materials, the commodities, the framing and concrete and the like continues to get more expensive. But we thought what we would try to do is if we could get an extra floor of height and go to 60 feet, however many units we accomplish on the top of that added floor through the rezone acceptance by your body and the, and the community council land use committee, and then obviously the planning staff, whatever amount of units we could achieve with that extra floor of height, we would earmark for essential housing, for workforce housing in Sugar House. And what we're trying to accomplish with the Thackeray Company is we're working on doing incentivized ways that the developer provides some affordable units in the community with the association of improved density. I know that the staff and you guys have been looking at different ways to do that in code, codes and conditions. And we thought that this would be a unique way that we could do something in the community of Sugar House where we would earmark 53 units uh, at an 80% AMI and have a workforce housing element of our project in return for the, um, the approval of the additional height. So as Lex mentioned and the staff mentioned, our ask is more from 45 feet to 60 feet of height. And that's in essence, the ask for the rezone request. And then the master plan change is obviously just extend Sugar House Central Business District one block further to the west. Thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant or for staff at this time? Sorry, I, I have another question for Lex, okay, so I'm sorry. Let, let's let Crystal go first and then you, Matt. Go ahead, Crystal. I get to go first, Matt. <laughs> um, I, I really like um, I, I the sugar house rezone makes sense. The extension to sixty feet. I think I'm following your reasoning makes sense for a lot of reasons. Um, I would like to strongly encourage that the Snell Grove sign be continued in the in the project development at some point. I don't think that's anything we can require, but um, I would love to see that used in that project. Crystal, Thank you. to show you what's coming, we've worked very diligently with our design team and the community to figure out ways to incorporate. We've even gone so far as to meet with Richard Snellgrove and the family to talk about preserving character, heritage, and history. We're going to save the original signage. We're going to incorporate the ice cream cone onto the east flank. It will be above art gallery space on 9th East and on an upper balcony and lit with a mural behind it. The whole idea is, is so the, the ice cream cone is visible with Estes Pizza and the wing company and the cool little retail, but it's also visible all the way down to the streetcar line. We've already reached out and it was a Yesco sign originally built. I even have the flavors of the ice cream and the why the Snell Grove family chose the colors that they did, and we will incorporate all of it into the exterior design and preserving it for the community. Thank you. Can I jump in real quick? Uh, uh, actually, Matt was next. John, if you're 
Go, oh, was that you left? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that? me. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Just in case you, you aren't aware, the, the developer Mark's uh, group has submitted an application for design review and that is currently being processed by the planning division. And you will see that in one of your uh, meetings uh, shortly. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thanks. Matt, go ahead. Um, so for the applicant, uh, if you're looking for inspiration, there's a Jimmy John's on 4th South that has done an ice cream cone. Okay. You maybe could, could think about. So, okay. Um, back. <laughs> so I already know where you're heading. Um, hey, uh, so, so for Lex, I just, again, I, I'm just trying to get my better understanding of how this kind of rezone fits into the kind of property in its own place. One of the things that I really thought was unfortunate and disliked about the Izzy project was the impact that it had on the residential districts that were right behind it. Um, and so as we're adding a new zone here, and I'm trying to read the sugar, the zoning code about the Sugar House Business District in your in the staff report. So what would the setback, there is that R15000 zone that's immediately to the uh, south of this project. What was the, what the setback requirements and the buffering that would, you know, that's in the, the sugar house specific business district zone that would um, kind of mitigate whatever happens with that residential stuff. You could just talk about that, please. Sure. Um, it, it, one of the things that I tried to demonstrate in the staff report with the photographs that I included was the fact that Commonwealth, with the exception of the, the house on the corner of, of 8th East and Commonwealth, that Commonwealth Street essentially serves as an alley. It's a city street, but yes, it abuts R15000, but it, it, it's access to all the garages for those houses that are around the corner on Elm. There's a considerable distance between this property and those houses. Um, this, the Sugar House Business District Zone, in terms of setbacks, is a, an urban zone. It's It's designed to be built to the sidewalk. It's to de designed to be built to the street. But in terms of the setback, um, you know, to that R15000 to the south, there's a considerable distance between the property lines and those houses. So, I mean, your, your staff report kind of outlines buffer yards and it outlines this, you know, the three feet of building height above 30 feet responds with a core spawning one foot of setback. How does that apply when you have a street, unlike the Izzy development that was right up against the, the houses, when you have a street, does that setback requirement still kick in even with the street there or does the street come into play and count as part of that? The street comes into play. That setback, and I wrote that many, many years ago, that regulation, and it was it was for where, it was on the north side of 21st South, more towards um, 11th East, where there are properties that abutted the sugar house business district zone that are zoned residentially they directly abut there's no street between them to buffer um, and so that step back and that decrease of um, uh, building height and step back was written for that type of scenario not the scenario that we have with the the, the snow grow factory property so if I'm on Commonwealth after this project's developed, am I looking straight up at a 60 foot building or am I looking at a building that is kind of staircased up like the other Sugar House districts are on 20 you know, Long Island and stuff? I mean, what is, how, what is the experience on Commonwealth going to be if this zone change goes through? Or what, what could it be in the worst case scenario? Well, there, there will have to, there's a, there's a step back required at 30 feet. That's in the Sugar House Business District zone. Um, if you're, if you own one of those houses on Elm, you're going to step into your backyard. You will see this building. There's no doubt about it. So it's, but it's 30 feet up and then back 15 feet and then up 30 and back 15. Is that how it works? Or what, what am I, what am I, what, what am I going to look at from, from, if I'm on a Commonwealth? You're going to look at you're going to look at 30 it's 30 feet it's just like anywhere else in the sugar house business district all those buildings that exceed that height that step back was designed so that um the as a from a pedestrian perspective along commonwealth that you would perceive 30 feet as opposed to 60. so it's not a 60 foot wall it's going to be a correct 
it's going to be a three foot building, a three story building with a, you know, roughly three stories, two to three story building back and then two and then two. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if, if, if as you're wandering through Sugar House, all the new development, all the new buildings, you'll notice that 30 foot step back. And, and like this is John, I, I was just going to mention and forgive me if I'm incorrect, but I believe that along Commonwealth, they have to have an active use as well. And so it's not going to be just the backside of a development. Um, That's true. Right. But there's no there's no yard. It's going to be built straight to Commonwealth. It's going to be 30 feet up. And then, you know, kind of tiered. Okay. So that's what's going to be. Yeah. It'll also have to have street trees. Well, it... Yeah, all those design elements will come into play when we actually, re you know, go through the, the design review process. Right. Thanks for that reminder. Okay. It, and also, um, that um, is something that um, I want to make sure that the public knows that we will be, uh, uh, this is a discussion about the zoning. We will be looking at the design if the zoning um, uh, goes through. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open up the public meeting uh, and see if there are anyone who would like to speak. If you have um, a little hand next to your name and you do not want to speak, could you just push the little hand button in the bottom again and that will take the little hand away. So I'm gonna call on, so uh, we do have someone from community council I see, so let's go ahead that first. All right, go ahead, Judy, if you'd like to speak. Thanks, Brenda. I'm Judy Short, the land use chair of the Sugar House Community Council. And I wanted to address uh, Matt's concern. Back in 2005, when the Sugar House Business District Master Plan was updated. We talked about bringing this zone all the way along 21st South to 7th East. But at that time, there were lots of buildings, uh, mostly west of 9th South, that were would have been non-conforming if that happened. And so we just couldn't get any traction on that. But I think there are many of us that have wanted this to happen for some years. It's not just a fly-by-night thing. And then to address the Wasatch Tenants United, Mark has already said there will be affordable housing in this building, so I hope you heard me. One thing that Community Council works hard at is making sure that that happens. And it's like pulling teeth. Now, the, the Sugar House Business District 2 zone is designed for a more neighborhood scale walkable community. 9th East and 21st South are now on a 15 minute bus schedule. And this is within a quarter mile of the uh, Sugar House track station. So we're hoping for walkability through this. We have engineering students at the University of Utah working with transportation to try to rework 21st South, what that barrier of too many cars from 7th East to 13th East because that's gonna be reconstructed in a couple of years. And we're hoping to add some bike lanes and make it more comfortable for pedestrians to walk. Um, and we like the fact that this has design guidelines. Uh, that's a big thing. One of my pet peeves is over the counter permits. So Mark has been to our meetings at least twice to land use, at least once to the main council and numerous other small meetings and we've been working through. We like the design and you'll see that soon. So we hope you'll approve the rezone. Thank you. Now members of the public who wish to speak. All right, we have a number of them. I'll start at the top of my list here and Molly, if you'll help keep an eye on that too so I don't skip anybody. Um, uh, David Fernandez, uh, you can go ahead and speak. We have two minutes. Um, sorry. Yeah, my only comment was uh, basically on the zoning. Lex and um, Mark have done a good job on their presentation and what the building's going to look like. But my comment was basically the fact that the zoning in Sugar House is this uh, factory uh, is very rare. And there's no way that this would ever become a factory again. Um, and there's communities in this in this valley that would just love to have this property and plant actually in their in their community. 
Um, I'm just, I'm just uh, saddened that this is, has to be torn down and uh, something else put in its place. My, my concern and my objection is basically the fact that the zoning is being changed to eliminate a, a factory that basically could be used somewhere else. Yeah. And other communities would kill for this opportunity. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. All right. Um, next, we have um, Ellie Kaufman, if you'd like to speak. Hi. So I think that the first thing that needs to be addressed here is that you guys are claiming that this property will be used to develop affordable housing, which is defined by the city as $1,300. Affordable housing to me is about 700, including utilities. So I don't want to hear that that is justifying the use of this property to develop more floors of unaffordable housing because calling $1,300 affordable is completely out of touch with the majority of Salt Lake City and what we make. I also want to note that Mark Isaac is saying that he has worked with the community. We are the community and we are telling you that we disagree with you. So you need to take that to note. Also, I want to say to John Lee's remark that luxury apartments make housing affordable for everyone. No, they don't. If this turns into luxury housing, even affordable, quote unquote, as in $1,300, that means that all of the old broken down apartment buildings a block away can justify raising their rent without actually making repairs to the building. So this affects all of the people living in all of those buildings too, not just who might potentially live in this future building. I also want to say that um, putting in murals and things like that on this building, sure, that's nice. As an artist, I would love an opportunity like that to contribute, except that I know that it's going to be on a building that I could never afford to live in. And that kind of hurts because you want artists to make these neighborhoods look nice, but you don't want us to be able to live there. And I think that that's important to know. I also think that the taller these are built, the more units there will be that are unaffordable and that's not helping anyone. I also want to say that what's the point of more luxury housing when all of the other luxury housing is still empty because none of us can actually afford it. I think that people are saying we're getting off topic as though these issues should not always be on the table. And I think you all need to note that you are being complicit in displacing low income families from this area if you approve the rezone without limiting in some way the price of each unit and who will actually be able to afford to live here because one thousand thirteen hundred dollars is not affordable okay thank you that's that's your time okay um it looks like the next uh individual is ian daxter ian if you want to go ahead you have two minutes yeah can you hear me yes, yes. cool um, so first I want to address Lex. Um, the reason these hearings are held is not because we're going to just talk about, uh, you know, some bureaucratic point about these uh, zoning measures. It's because we, you need to hear from the community about the effects they're concerned it's going to have on the community, this rezone. So these concerns are totally valid to bring up, and I think it's ridiculous for you to act like this is somehow unfounded. Um, all these things, the aesthetics, all of it, whatever, this is part of it. I'm not done. Um, second, um, to address Lee, there are vacancies um, every year in Utah for the last little bit, like last year, vacancies went up, so did rent. Um, the supply side, affordable housing does not exist on the same market as all the other housing. Uh, a $1,700 apartment is not, it's not there because they need to fill it. It's there because they need to, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of capital storage. This is from the state report. This is what the state report on affordable housing is thinking about the majority of the building in the city. Um, yeah, uh, this was already mentioned uh, by Eli, but uh, income limits, when you look at the AMI brackets, what the research, re what the redevelopment agency defines as affordable is anything in the moderate income bracket or lower. That is, that comes out to about 1300, somewhere around there. Um, other affordable, you know, brackets like fair market or whatever, 960, that's ridiculous. Um, it's just simply not affordable, especially when you look at the living wage of the city. Um, which is about $11.60. This is from the state report on affordable housing. You can all go and read it. I'm sure a lot of you have. Um, I think that it's silly for you to act ignorant and try to shamelessly bribe us with uh, unsubstantiated promises. Um, yeah, uh, $11.60. Uh, after utilities, this is according to the state, the maximum someone should be paying for it to be affordable and not burdensome is $730. Uh, $730. 
Uh, that's after utilities. So, um, I mean, if, if the developer is ready to promise in paper and actually work with like public institutions to be bound to build affordable housing on that level, on that income level, I think we should, but I don't think that, I think it's really cynical for you to just say like, oh yeah, if you approve our thing, we're gonna give you what you want. Um, yeah, uh, eventually the day is gonna come where you have to actually look at us and you have to meet in public and it's gonna be really not fun if we have to bring an army of people who are pissed off because they can't afford to live in their house. So, okay, uh, Mr. Daxter, your time is up. Thank you thank for your you. comments. All right. Um, we will go to Michelle Maurer. Michelle, would you like to speak? You have two minutes. I would. Yes, I would. And can you hear me? Yes. My name is Michelle Maurer. Um, yeah, I just want to echo uh, what's been said by Eli and Isaac, or <laughs> sorry, Eli and Ian. Um, yeah. Uh, this the yeah like what lex was saying like listing all these reasons why it might be kind of um uh trying to not use a, a cuss word um you know not ideal like things like traffic congestion short sidewalks like it can be an eyesore all these things and how this meeting isn't really about these issues um, you're the planning commission, so yeah, it kind of is. We are here to tell you that that's what this is about. This is about y'all kicking out people, people being kicked out of their homes because they can't afford any longer housing in the area where you keep putting up these unaffordable complexes. Um, yeah, and to reiterate um, what the city means by affordable and how they're pulling teeth out to to make affordable housing a possibility like come come on that's not the thirteen hundred dollars and in that range like that's not you clearly are so disconnected and it's the same pattern we see across all these issues with the city you all are so disconnected and you clearly don't give a fudge about these people who are being are so vastly impacted by your decisions and it is deplorable um yeah this was mentioned but mark isaac saying that he's they've been working with the community no um like eli said we are the community the snell grove family does not represent the entire community and it's really really like disturbing to hear y'all discuss and have fun about like how can we incorporate an ice cream cone that's kind of irrelevant when people are being evicted or being slowly pushed out of the place they've lived their whole lives because of y'all, because you guys just keep putting up these buildings. Was that a, someone sigh? Am I, yeah. Um, yeah, so if this zoning is approved, just, yeah, it just shows um, how out of touch you all are. And we are demanding that the zoning not be approved. And again, Michelle, Michelle I'm sorry, but your two minutes are up at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, the next speaker we have is Soren Simonson. Go ahead, Soren. Thank you. I'm gonna make a more general comment, although I am supportive of the rezone. Um, I wanna just talk for a minute about um, uh, the, the CC zone, which exists in a few pockets along 2100 South. This actually came to my attention a few days ago when I saw uh, a blog post about a new In-N-Out burger being proposed near State Street and 2100 South in an area of Salt Lake City that has probably the best transit and uh, connections. All three tracks lines are within a couple of blocks. The streetcar line, um, frequent bus service on 2100 South and State Street. And we're, we're uh, apparently moving in the direction of another drive through. Um, so I want to, I want to talk about the power of the planning commission to initiate a petition. I've kind of exhausted options over the years for the planning for the city council to initiate a petition to rezone uh, 2100 South. Um, and uh, haven't unfortunately seen much movement from the administration on this either. The Planning Commission can initiate petitions um, other than the property owner, and I would like to request the Planning Commission to consider a petition to rezone all of the remaining CC parcels on 2100 South to 
um, zones that are compatible with the master plans uh, in, in this area. We have a, a wonderful vision for Salt Lake called Plan Salt Lake. Uh, it talks on page nine about placemaking. It talks on pages 17 through 21 about neighborhoods and affordable housing and growth. It talks on page uh, 23 about affordable transportation and mobility and other choices. And it talks on page 31 about beautiful city. I think many of you are probably familiar with, with many of these ideas. We have really fantastic master plans and it doesn't get past me that we have master plans that talk about affordable housing that's not being implemented. So I would request the planning commission to initiate a petition to rezone, not just this parcel, but all of the CC parcels and eliminate them uh, across the 2100 South corridor. Thank you, Soren. Your time's up. Thank you. All right, uh, the next uh, participant we have is uh, Le Lexi Langford. Lexi, you have two minutes. Hi, um, Hi, I hope you all can hear me okay. Um, yes. I just want to reiterate the fact that these are our homes. This is where we have been living. This is, you know, I've spent my savings to be able to try to get a nice place for myself. And with all due respect or no respect, Mark Isaac is trying to stuff his pockets with money. And that extra floor, the extra low income housing is not going to be for people who really need it. It is helping the rich get richer. And as the, the voters, I really, really hope that you see that and you care about the community more than you care about helping people make more money than they even need. That's all. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Uh, it looks like Tom Greenlee, would you like to speak? You have two minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm a property owner. We own a home right behind uh, Commonwealth Avenue there on, on Elm. And um, I'm not an indie person. We support more high density housing and we support turning the uh, ice cream factory into a residential uh, project. It could be good for all concerned. Um, my one concern though, is the aesthetic of it. Um, to the amateur, these buildings all look alike. Anyone driving down the street will know, oh, that's 2019, oh, that's 2020. Um, the architects seem to never have had a futuristic or a retro look, they all seem to copy each other. And what I wondered is, um, is it possible that we could build more traditional looking buildings that are newer but they look older. Let me ask a question of the commission right now. If every single building in Sugar House were replaced with a new, more modern building and all of the look of Sugar House of the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s were destroyed, is that okay with you? Yes or no? I'm done. Thank you very much. Is there uh, anyone else who wants to There's speak? There's a couple more individuals. Uh, the next person up is Tyler Adams. Tyler, if you want to go ahead. Hey, thanks so much. Um, I want to echo what a few of the commenters said earlier about um, the affordable housing. If affordable housing means thirteen hundred dollars a month is a joke. I currently uh, own a home on Elm, and my mortgage is less than that. That's right. I own a piece of sugar house for less than what you want to give an affordable home to someone for and that's just not the way to go about it if you want to set up affordable housing for people you have to set up pro programs for people who actually because i can tell you that there's no way in hell i would ever pay 1300 dollars a month to uh, be right on 2100 south secondly i want this question answered because it seems like you continually to ignore everyone's questions here if this is approved with the zoning what is, is the potential for the affordable housing to be rezoned to market rate at any given time in the future? I yield my time. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have one more. Um, Annie, Annie Lim, um, if you want to go ahead, you have two minutes. Annie, are you with us? Annie, last name L-I-M. Okay, I'll try and unmute you one more time. Your hand is up. So if you didn't want to speak, that's um, this is your time if you'd like to. 
Okay, I think we're having some issues here. Um, Andy, if you're unable to speak, what we can do is you can send comments to planning.comments at slcgov.com and we'd be happy to share them. I believe Molly probably has a few that she would needs to read into the record as well, commissioners. Thank you. Molly, do you have anything? Yes, I do. Um, and uh, I, again, as with the previous item, uh, there were a number of emails that came in within the last 24 hours. Um, if we received those emails prior to 5 p.m. today, they were uh, PDF'd and put in your Dropbox. So I bring your attention to all of those emails, and there are a number of them, um, probably 10 or 12 at least. Um, <clears throat> so anything received after 5 is what I'm about to read to you. The first is from Stephanie Christian, uh, subject 21st South Snellgrove. I am writing to ex express my opposition to the reasoning proposal on 21st South near the old Snellgroves. Adding the proposed amount of housing to that area of 21st South will create an unsustainable amount of congestion. The congestion is already an issue that needs to be addressed. I am not opposed to dense housing, however, the additional traffic and needs need to be addressed more thoroughly than what is proposed. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, the next one is from Holly Brown, subject, no more condos in Sugar House. The proposed plan for the old Snellgrove site is a bad idea. Sugar House is getting so built out and the charm that once made this neighborhood so desirable is all but gone. Traffic is insane, especially on 21st South from 7th East to 1300 East. The roads aren't designed for the drastic increase in traffic. I have lived in Sugar House for 48 years and have watched it deteriorate. Cramming another condo into the area only benefits the developers because it certainly isn't benefiting residents. When will enough be enough? How about focusing on open spaces and developing unique features that will add to the community instead of another chain restaurant or retail store that would be out of business in six months. Instead of telling taxpayers of proposed building, how about asking area residents what we'd like to see? I guarantee no one will say more condos and retail. Uh, that is the extent of the emails that I have um, for this item to read into the record. As I said, there were a number of emails that were placed in your Dropbox today. Um, so I hope you got a chance to look at those. Thank you. Is there anyone else who has not spoken who wishes to speak? I see something blinking here. Kim, Kim, Kimia? Has Kimia spoken? Um, I, she did not. Um, there isn't a hand up, but I can definitely okay. unmute yeah, her. I, see I, I, keep her I keep seeing it blink on and off and blink on. So maybe it's just connection problems. All right. Is the Q&A um, active? Um, no, we uh, we did not engage it today. But um, Commissioner, okay. let, let me unmute um, Kimia Golchin and see if she wants to or wants that they would like. That to now there's a hand. Now there's not a hand. Okay. Yeah, let's let's try this. Um, Kimia, you are um, okay. unmuted. Sorry. So if you'd like to speak. Okay, thanks for unmuting me. I didn't know if it was working or not. Um, I just wanted to comment on Lex's comment. He said there's a considerable amount of uh, distance between the houses on um, that butt up against Commonwealth and the factory. There is not a considerable distance. There is no sidewalk on the backside of those garages and there's no park strip along the sidewalk um, on the other side of the factory. Um, it is used as a... Um, as an alleyway, but it's also used to get to the houses that are on the rest of Elm Avenue and the businesses like Trolley Wing Company and Estee and all of those right there, you know, people come along and use both of those streets. Um, I was told in the initial meeting when they talked about the rezone that rezoning from commercial to the Sugar House Business District meant that we would have opportunity to comment um, if we rezoned it as it currently sits as a uh, commercial, it, I was told that basically the developer could do whatever they wanted to do. And so by, re, by approving the rezone that allows 
everyone to kind of comment on it. And that wasn't brought up at all tonight. I don't know if what was told in the past is something that's still relevant. Um, I just want to speak up. I agree with that. There is not a big setback. I mean, they're already. I'm removing. sorry. Who are you and who is speaking now? Tyler, I'm sorry. You, you've had your opportunity. I should have. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, there's no, there isn't a lot of space. I do agree with whoever mentioned that they should put trees. I don't know how you're going to fit trees there if you're putting property right up against the sidewalk. Um, I'm not opposed to the development. I just think that you need to make sure you consider the residents that are around. Um, someone earlier mentioned that you know you could go up 30 feet and then set back and then you know continue the setback. So it's not like a giant 60 foot tower right there. Please consider that. Um, when you're building this so that the residents can actually continue enjoying the space. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so I'm going to um, close the public hearing. And bring Do you want to try to unmute Annie Lim again? She, she already spoke. Oh, no. No, she hasn't. Okay. Um, we, we can try one last time. Um, Annie, your hand is up. Did you want to speak? Can you hear me? Yes. And it's working. Oh, perfect. Great. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. So I just want to say, first of all, um, I'm with Los Edge Tenants United, and I do want to mention, um, we've said this a few times, but the $1,300 a month, I mean, mathematically, I mean, I was taught that your rent should take up 30% of your income. So you have to make at least 52K a year, and the average income of Utah is somewhere around like 38. I mean, and I know that includes more rural counties, so there's a data skew there, but it just is unreasonable. And I can't remember exactly what... Uh, I think his name is Mark Isaacs said, but I think he only said 10% would have been affordable housing, which is not reflective of the population at all. And so, yeah, it doesn't make much sense to me if you're trying to like say, hey, we're doing a good thing for the local economy and the local people when that just isn't a correct representation of the population at all. And again, I mean, like Commonwealth, I do on another note, it is hardly a street. So to, to like advertise as a four way block is inaccurate. And I think just if anything, they're kind of saying that, if anything, to kind of skew to yet again, make these more condos, which people don't really want. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion. I would like to emphasize that we are, um, dealing with a rezone request. Um, and the rezone request has to do with height, density, access, other things like that that have to do with zoning. The Planning Commission does not um, deal directly with whether or not a project has affordable housing. So my question is, um, the applicant is actually saying they're going to build, build affordable housing, but that is not something we can write into the zoning change recommendation. Is that, is that correct? Paul? Sorry, trying to find the mute button. Um, yes, that is correct. That is uh, that is not something that is part of this recommendation that uh, the Planning Commission can offer to the City Council. Um, sometimes the City Council has different tools that they can use uh, to uh, encourage affordable units uh, are built but um but you are you are correct we cannot require that okay thank you um sorry so just like just to keep painting this picture for me along commonwealth so under the sugar house uh, business district there are sidewalk kind of requirements aren't there like minimum sidewalk requirements and all that Lex, we can't hear you, Lex. Matt, uh, you were breaking up. I didn't hear anything you said. Sorry, just uh, I'm just trying to again get more into Commonwealth here. So, this, and address one of the comments made by the by the public was that under the Sugar House Business District, there aren't there requirements for minimum sidewalk widths and uh, if parkings in front and all that sort of stuff are within the design or within the zone or no. Yes. Yeah. Do you know what those are? Um, not off the top of my head. And Matt, when we come to you with the design review, all of that will be addressed in that staff report. 
I understand, Lex, but like uh, I'm looking at a rezone, how the impact is based on the residential districts that are right there neighboring it. I'm just trying to get my mind better around how that impact is. So I do think these are zoning questions. I don't think these are design questions I'm asking. Doesn't the report then, say 15 feet? For minimum sidewalk width? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. I, Matt, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry, I can't answer that question right now. Um, Commissioner, in, in general, I think the standard is five feet. Um, I think we've seen along Highland and those other places where the developers were willing to offer more sidewalk, um, but I don't know that there was ever that mandate to install it from our side of things. And there's no, they're not going to add parking or you know, street improvements there. They wouldn't have to as part of this rezone either, right? As part of the rezone? As part of any future development to meet the standards and the sugar gas businesses, they would need to, there wouldn't need to be any no street improvements or anything in there. Uh, that's to be determined. Okay. I mean, that's under review as part of the design review. So it's, it looks like currently that the right of way, uh, that the, there's no space between the actual cartway, the the road itself, and the building, very little where a sidewalk would go. So a sidewalk normally goes in the right of way, not on the property itself. If that helps sort of explain it. So I've got a question for staff is in um, the during the remainder of this process, if there is a stipulation of affordable housing, what is the process of that being maintained over time? I know it's not part of the rezone, but if it's part of the design review or some sort of a stipulation um, and allowing the building, what what are the recourses that the city takes if, if that's not held up? For clarity. You know, Commissioner, I don't know that we have ever required um, affordable housing through the design review. I think we've had people who suggested it. Um, you know, I, I think it would be difficult for us to enforce that, to be honest with you, because it's not going to like, we don't have a citywide affordable housing bank that we work with. Um, if they were working with a local nonprofit, that might be different. Um, you know, they could have a deed restriction recorded on there and that is enforceable. But I, I just, like I said, I don't know that we've ever done that as a design review. Um, and I don't know if Paul, you might want to comment on that. Well, I guess my question is if, it, if it's offered and we accept what's like, anyone could say they're going to offer it and then not do it. So I, mean, right. I guess my, that's my question. I mean, actually, John, we can't require it and we can't, even if they offer it, they can turn around and go back on that. We're just hoping that they're honorable people and, uh, and, um, and um, that that will occur, but we don't. Oftentimes uh, when there is an affordable housing, um, Trying to find the right words here, not necessarily an offer, but um, a promise, a commitment to affordable housing. There will be uh, some some form of a uh, deed restriction on the property for a given number of years. Again, I don't know that that could happen here, um, you know, even if it is voluntary. It, it uh, really couldn't like happen. Brenda said it would be difficult, if not impossible, to enforce. Yeah. Um, Paul, I guess if if for example through this rezone process and the master plan amendment, um, the owners of the property were willing to enter into a development agreement with the city requiring a deed restriction. I suppose they could do that if on a voluntary case, but I think it would have to be on a council level. It couldn't necessarily be done on the planning commission on the design review level. Yeah, uh, so in a recent case, the council did as part of a, I think it was part of a rezone, um, require a commitment of affordable housing and that mechanism is uh, it's still unclear how that's uh, in my mind that's uh, unclear how that be, that's being executed um, you are correct uh, John we can't do that at the, the planning commission level if the plan if the city council wants to try to tackle that um, then we can try but it's it's not a simple process 
and uh, particularly in light of legislation that's been proposed that would prohibit cities from uh, mandating affordable housing despite all the legislatures talk about how much uh, they want to promote that well it, it might be a good discussion topic for a future meeting when we have a light schedule but i think it's an important one to have um especially with you know how important we say it is i'd like it to we we find a solution to it if we can so that's that's all i got on that if procedurally brenda am i allowed to speak to you during this conversation yeah, not, not unless we address you thank you mark crystal I mean, as I understand it today, the question before us is, should this be a factory or should we be exp <laughs> expanding the Sugar House Business District? Um, and I think probably we all agree towards that. But I, I, I want to echo what John's saying is I would appreciate, we last meeting we talked about future education for the commission and our tools as a commission to impact affordable housing are pretty limited. It really sits with council as the policymakers, but I, I would certainly be open and appreciative of education to learn how more we could accomplish. And sorry, my children are very loud behind me. Thank you. Um, Commissioner, I can mention that to the director. I do know that he was planning on trying to provide um, some future education opportunities. Thank you. So do I have any more comments from the commission? I have one yes. really quick. Um, I kind of wanted to address two of the questions and I only wrote down first names. So uh, Kimia and Tom, you know, uh, I'm just your average citizen. So when I started getting involved in community stuff, I had to learn a lot of jargon. And so I wanted to address Kimia's um, uh, question about this coming back to her or to the public. Um, this is part of the jargon part. So when um, the proposal for a Sugar House Business District 2 then would require a design review, um, the current CC zone would not require a design review. That is the function of bringing it back um, to the community um, to participate and to um, give their voice to that. So it does, it does accomplish that. But I think also then in response to Tom's question about design, um, I've learned that when we call it design review, it doesn't mean design that your average person thinks what design means. Um, so we don't we don't get the purview of um, looking at the architecture. I personally hate modern architecture. Other people on the commission like it. Other people don't. Um, it is that beauty in the eye of the beholder bit, but it is not part of our purview um, to talk about actually how things are designed. We talk a lot about how sites function um, and how they engage um, based on master plans. And so I just wanted to throw that out for them. I hope that they do follow this process and continue to participate um, when the actual proposal comes before them. Um, but as a Sugar House resident and somebody who's been very involved um, in, in land use for about 15 years in my neighborhood now, um, I'm pretty much in support of giving this the Sugar House Business District too, um, because it makes it makes a lot of sense and it is something that um, we've, we've addressed verbally as a community council for a long time. So I support that zoning change. So um, do we have, uh, if we have no further comments, burning comments? Brenda, I, I have two comments. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Uh, to follow up on what Amy just said about design and design review, um, <clears throat> the Planning Commission's purview is not about the style of architecture. Style is a matter of taste. Design is a matter of principle. And the design review process and the standards for design review are uh, written in a way to uh, engage the applicant, engage the commission, engage the community in a discussion of um, the, the principles of design, and in particular, how that building interfaces with the public side of things. Um, so how does the mass impact the public street? Um, are there windows at the ground floor, that kind of thing? 
uh, but maybe we should save the rest of that conversation for when you're actually reviewing the um, you're, you're doing the design review. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, just quickly mention to those um, from Wasatch Tenants United and, and others who are interested in um, engaging in an affordable housing conversation, our office is working on an affordable housing zoning overlay um, that uh, would affect a, a lot of the city. And we're always looking for members of the public to engage us in conversation about what that policy should be um, and how we can set the framework um, for future development and encouraging the development of affordable housing, um, affordable uh, in the broader definition and affordable in the kind of official uh, uh, federal definition of affordable. Um, so I encourage those of you listening to, uh, you're welcome to reach out to us. I think I have a few of your emails from, from earlier today. We'd be willing to engage you and and happy to have that conversation. Um, it's always great to hear new voices participate in the planning process. Um, and uh, we're glad to have had, had, we're glad that you were able to join us this evening. Thank you, Molly. Um, so bring me a motion. Who is that? Crystal. Crystal, please make a motion. Um, can I make it with a preamble? <laughs> I just yeah. want to add quickly that I also hope we don't lose Soren's suggestion of petitioning to extend the community, the, the Sugar House Business Zone West down 21st South. And the other comment I would make in my preamble is uh, as we consider the affordable housing overlay, I personally am really struggling with the questions of density at all costs versus neighborhood character versus affordable housing. So I hope Planning Commission, as they will, since you're amazing, will consider all of that. But here's my motion based on the analysis and findings in the staff report that amendments for master plans and the standards for zoning map amendments have been substantially met testimony in the proposal presented. I move that the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation to the City Council in support of the proposed amendments located at approximately 850 and 870 East 21st South. Do I have a second? A second. I'm sorry, who was that? Adrian. Adrian, okay, thank you. Okay, I have a motion from Crystal and a second from Adrian. And uh, is this just for the master plan amendment for the zoning and or is it for both? Zoning and master plan? This is for both the way the motion is worded. Okay, thank you. So just to clarify, Maureen. Sorry, did we get the um, PLN numbers included in that motion? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, it's at the top of the motion sheet. If you could just amend your motion to include those um, the PLN number, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm in my motion to approve the amendment for the proposal of PLN PCM-00906 and 00925. Thank you. Thank you. So, Maureen? Yes. Amy? Sorry, I was taking something out of my puppy's mouth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Adrian. Yes. Carolyn. Oh, great. John. Yes. Matt. Uh, yeah, so just to the Wasatch Chess Association, I want to say thank you for coming. I think it's important to have your kind of comments here because it keeps reminding us uh, of how critical an issue this is. I would also add, I think you, you, you have more allies both on this body and in the planning department and on the city council um then maybe you you feel and so we do we, we we all of us want to address this issue and it's something that's there um i do um and, and also i mean there's certain things that we can control and we can't and 
that we don't set the rate of what is considered affordable. And so making sure that we look and discuss that with the property agencies is important. Um, this project does, I think, fit the surrounding areas and it does, is compatible with, with, with what the kind of areas to the west and the south and the way that protections are set up. And so I'm, I'm going to approve and I say yes to the motion as well. Thank you. Sarah? Um, I'm going to vote yes, but yeah, I also want to say I have loved the activity okay. at this meeting and for all of those participating, I hope this is, I hope if this is what's passionate to you that you find uh you know come and connect with the city in other ways as you've been invited to do and this could be the start of it decades of service thank you crystal yes and i echo the invitation and i okay. think all of us are eminently googleable if you want to sit down with us happy to thank you um we're going to be adjourned for two minutes Move on to uh, item number three in our agenda, which is the Riley Plan Development and Preliminary Subdivision Flats at approximately 1159 East, 1300 South. And it is case number PLN PCM 2020-00681 and PLN SUB 2020-00683 and we have Amanda presenting for us tonight. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. So I am presenting a plan development and preliminary subdivision plot tonight. Um, so the plan development is uh, located in the R15000 zoning district. Um, the purpose of a plan development is to support the efficient uh, use of land and resources and also allow flexibility in the zoning ordinance. The applicant is asking for uh, zoning modifications for a few reasons. Uh, 
The plan development is proposed for two lots. Uh, lot one is requesting a, well, both lots are requesting a lot width reduction. The R15000 zone requires uh, 50 feet per lot um, for new lots. And lot one is proposed to be 46 feet. And lot two is pr proposed to be 40.25 um, feet. Uh, the second modification to the zoning ordinance would be for the interior side yard setback of lot one, which would be reducing the setback from four feet to three feet. Um, other than the lot width on lot two, it would meet um, all other zoning requirements. And then um, I'm also bringing the subdivision flat to you because lot one exceeds the maximum lot size of 7,500 square feet. It's just a bit over and is about uh, 7,538 7, square feet. So uh, I am, I'm bringing it to you because if it does exceed the 7,500, it needs to go through the subdivision process, even if it's just a little bit. Uh, staff is recommending approval of both the plan development and the subdivision with the conditions listed in the staff report. Uh, so here's a little aerial. Uh, the subject prop property is in red, and then the proposed boundary line is uh, down the middle. The um, subject properties are would both be accessed via private alleyway um, off of 1300 South. There is an easement in place, and uh, which allows them uh, alleyway access. Some property photos. Uh, lot number two, the I'll, I'll go into the parking requirements in just a moment, but the subject property is uh, top left, uh, existing driveway, driveway which will remain uh, to service lot two parking is top right. And then the bottom photos are the rear yard of the existing uh, property. Uh, parking would be located behind the existing home, which would um, move to the lot number one. And then where the garage is would be uh, parking for lot number two. Uh, some more site photos. There is a duplex uh, right next door to the subject property to the east. And then to the west of the property is a single family home, which is set back uh, considerably farther than the, the current home is. And then there are also single family homes across the street on 1300 South. So uh, while reviewing the plan development proposal, one of the considerations was a lot with, which is why they need to um, come to the planning commission. The current lot is 86 feet wide. Uh, in 2010, the, so the, the parcel origin was originally two separate parcels and it was consolidated in, consolidated in 2010. Uh, this was done through Salt Lake County and did not receive Salt Lake City planning approval. Uh, so the applicant is essentially coming back, um, but it's a new property owner coming back to resubdivide the property into what was uh, there originally. Uh, so the currently the property is the widest on the block base at 86 feet and the average lot width on the on 1300 south uh, the north side of the street is 52 feet and the average lot width on the south side of the street is 48 feet uh, the r15000 zone requires a side yard setback of 10 feet on one side and four feet on the other uh, the applicant is proposing that lot one has a 10 foot setback on the west the current home is actually 15 feet but the plat would technically show uh, 10 feet if the house were to be removed, which they are not proposing. And then they're uh, proposing that lot one has a reduced side yard setback from four feet to three feet. Lot number two would meet all applicable uh, setbacks for the R15000 zone. And then the proposed front yard setback is approximately 33 feet which is the average of the block base. Uh, consideration number two is the driveway and parking location. This is the, the main um, 
comment from the public is where are these people are going, you know, where are the tenants going to park or where the or the new property owners are going to park. So 1300 South does not allow parking on the north side of the street. There is a shared bike lane. Uh, there is parking lot on the south side of the street. So uh, if this were to be approved, uh, the the zone requires two off street parking spaces per single family detached dwelling. So what I did was I'm I'm showing in uh, yellow the the top left is the alleyway um, easement. So lot number one, if subdivided, would access rear rear yard parking via this alleyway, and um, this was approved by the transportation Div division. So they would access rear yard parking, and then the existing driveway off of 1300 South would then um, be on lot number two, and that was uh, the driveway would lead to either a a detached garage or parking. Um, both could be accessed via that alleyway. Uh, the bottom left hand photo is a photo of where the uh, proposed parking for lot number one is and then uh, lot number two, uh, the bottom right hand photo would be accessed via that driveway. There is an existing garage and code does not allow a detached uh, accessory structure to be located um, on a lot without a, a principal dwelling unit. So prior to recording the final plat, the applicant would need to demolish the garage, which was already a part of their um, plan for the property. And uh, so I showed on the site plan, you have the private alley, which is on the top of the page, and then uh, existing garage. And then the, uh, the, the pink outline is the buildable area for each lot. Lot number one, a little bit over 7,500 square feet, and then lot number two is about 6,900 square feet. So both of them exceed the minimum lot size of 5,000 5, square feet for the zone. Uh, the applicant is proposing to keep the existing home and then build a, a, a second detached dwelling on the um, lot number two. And then here are some photos of the existing alley which would provide sole access to the first property and then could be the secondary access for the second property. Uh, the photos on the bottom show the fence that's uh, along the rear yard of the subject property. And that is, so they'd have to you know, remove the fence and either put a parking pad or potentially a detached garage if it met the accessory structure standards. Uh, about half of the properties on this alleyway are accessed um, they have either a detached garage or uh, a parking pad that the uh, residents or property owners use. And then the consideration number three. So the applicant has not per, uh, submitted building plans or uh, elevations for the uh, single family home that they're proposing on lot number two. They wanted to make sure that the, uh, the property could be subdivided before they put the additional finances into the building plans, but uh, a condition of approval would be to uh, make sure that the, the new home was subject to the front facade controls. And so the new single family dwelling on lot two would be constructed using quality materials such as brick and stone, and then could also use accent materials such as party board, siding, or stucco. And these are materials found on the street and in the swarming neighborhood. And, um, and then the front facade controls would require that no less than 10% um, of the front facade, let me rephrase that. So the front facade would have to include uh, entrance door, windows, porch, landing, architectural features that address the street, create a more pedestrian friendly environment, and then um, those architectural features could not total less than 10% of the front facade. So, uh, for example, the the new dwelling wouldn't the main access to the new dwelling wouldn't be able to be on like the side yard of the property. And um, and then I wrote down the the definition of the actual definition of that front facade control um, section of code is to main, maintain architectural harmony and primary orientation along the street 
All buildings shall be required to include an entrance door and other features as windows, balconies, porches, and other architectural features in the front facade of the building, totaling not less than 10% of the front facade elevation area, excluding any area used for roof structures. For buildings constructed on a corner lot, only one front facade is required in either the front or corner side facade of the building. Uh, and in, in the applicant's narrative, they spoke to using poly materials and I clarified with them um, before, before we published the staff report, I clarified what the stipulations would be for the current home because there aren't um, submitted building plans and they, they agreed that they'd like to keep with the architectural character of the neighborhood um, and use the same uh, building material palette. And then consideration number four, uh, reviewing the planned development objectives and citywide master plans. So this, as stated in their narrative, um, they mostly focus on master plan implementation, which is um, one, subdividing the lot back into its uh, close to original state and uh, promoting infill development, which is one of the uh, goals of the city and then also historic preservation so the existing home will remain and retaining structures within these neighborhoods is a goal of the city as well and um, that will help maintain neighborhood stability and character and also support neighbor neighborhoods and districts uh, this property is located uh, directly east of a neighborhood commercial zone where there is a local gross, grocery store, uh, schools nearby, public um, public schools nearby, and then as well as restaurants. And so uh, part of the citywide and community-wide master plans is to preserve the existing single family home. And then also the new proposal for the uh, detached single family home would meet growth and housing policies, um, including infill development, locating the new development in areas with existing infrastructure and amenities, preserving the character of single family neighborhoods uh, while increasing home ownership, and then also uh, uh, providing a way to accommodate our uh, city's population growth. So the plan development standards uh, modifications, which will result in a better product and uh, also complying with the master plan expectations for the area. And then the preliminary plot is the, the proposed subdivision does meet the uh, preliminary plot uh, uh, section of code, but it was included in this presentation because the, the proposed lot size exceeds the maximum of the uh, R15000 zone but the size configuration and the relationship of the lot width to the lot depth is uh, compatible. So staff is recommending approval of both the plan development and the uh, preliminary plan subject to the conditions. Thank you, Amanda. Thank uh, you. So is the applicant here? Yes, I am. Would you like to uh, speak to the commission? Sure. Um, Amanda did a great job. I mean, there's not a whole lot I can add. She did an excellent job presenting uh, the opportunity. The one thing I would like to add is that you know my wife and I are both uh, graduates from Westminster College, which is right here in the area. We're familiar with the community. We've lived in the community, and um, you know I'm, I'm mainly ad addressing this to hopefully uh, not get bombarded with the Wasatch tenant community. That you know, I'm not a developer trying to line my pockets, but this was a specific project that um, we located because there was an opportunity to build a new home in a really really cool area. Um, we have committed to keeping the character of the surrounding neighborhood and providing ample parking and doing everything we can uh, and also comply with the city's master plan and goals of being able to provide housing in this area and redevelop underutilized areas. So uh, open to any questions, um, but yeah, I appreciate the time and great job, Amanda. Thank you. Uh, does the commission have any questions for the applicant or for staff? Okay, hearing none, I will move to the public hearing. Um, and uh, does the community council wish to speak? Still there. You know, 
At the moment, there are three hands up, but they are all people who have to spoke earlier. So, um, which, which they certainly are welcome to speak again. Um, I just want to make sure if if you do not want to speak, to uh, maybe lower your hand. And then for those people who may have been late to the meeting, if you'd like to speak, there is a little small hand icon on the bottom right hand corner. Um, and just click that button and that would indicate to us that you would like to speak. Um, so at the moment, um, Madam Chair, I have two indicating they'd like to speak. The first one would be David Fernandez. David, would you like to speak on this item? Sorry, no, I've been trying to eliminate that. Oh. Hand. No, that's no, no, problem. no problem. Thank you. Um, the second one would be um, Eli Kaufman. Did you want to speak on this item? Ellie. Ellie, I'm sorry. No, I took my hand down, but it doesn't seem to have updated. Okay, no, that sometimes this happens. So thank you. We just wanted to make sure you didn't lose that opportunity. So um, other than that, I don't have any other hands raised. Okay. Uh, no new emails uh, yeah. received regarding this item. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring this back to the commission for consideration or a, or a um, motion. Madam Chair, I'm willing to make a motion if no one has any questions or comments. Okay. Uh, based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information is presented and input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the Plan Development Petition PLN PCM 2020-00681 and Preliminary Subdivision Plat PLN SUV 2020-00683 as proposed, subject to complying with conditions listed in the staff report. Go ahead, second. I'll second. Okay, I have, a, I have a motion by Amy and a second by Maureen. So we're going to go ahead down the roll again. Maureen? Yes. Amy? Yes. Adrian? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. John? Yes. Matt? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Crystal? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you all um, for your time and consideration. Uh, I'm now going to turn the meeting over to Amy. Uh, unmute. Um, and okay. Uh, all right, we will move on to the fourth item on our agenda, which is PLN PCM 2020 dash zero zero nine four four an attached accessory dwelling unit at uh, 1395 east michigan avenue and amanda is presenting on this report as well uh, thank you uh, so this a uh, conditional use request is for an attached ADU at 1395 East Mission Avenue. The applicant and property owner is Prescott Muir. Um, he is per, uh, proposing a 963 square foot ADU in the basement of the existing single family dwelling. Uh, it'll be the basement is walkout and the entrance to the ADU will be located in the rear yard. Uh, the Subject property is shown on the page, and then uh, the the applicant is proposing that the tenant parking be located on the driveway uh, to fulfill the one off off street parking space requirement. Uh, the planning commission can waive that if there is legal on street parking, or if the property is located within a quarter of a mile of a transit stop. Uh, there is legal on street parking on Michigan Avenue and there are multiple uh, public transit stops located within the within the area as well within one fourth mile. Here is a landscaping plan. So there are going to be no exterior modifications to the to the home. Uh, the applicants proposing to add a walkway. Uh, 
around the uh, west side of, or the, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, the west, the west side of the home, leading to the rear, which is where the entrance of the ADU is. So that's what the uh, the blue path is. Here is a floor plan with the ADU entrance highlight highlighted. Uh, the proposed ADU encompasses 32% of the gross square footage of the home. For uh, ADU located within a, a single family home, the ADU can encompass. 50% uh, of the gross square footage. And so this uh, falls below that. And then here are some property photos. So the proposed walkway would go um, just to the left of the, the subject property. So the top left photo of the, the walkway would uh, wrap around that. And then the top right photo shows where the entrance of the walkway is proposed to be. Um, and then the bottom left photo is the rear facade where the ADU entrance is to be located. And then uh, legal on-street parking is shown on the bottom, bottom right. Uh, the neighborhood consists of mostly single family dwellings, which this photo shows. And uh, staff's recommending approval of the condition, conditional use request for the proposed uh, attached accessory dwelling unit uh, subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Um, any questions from the commissioners for staff? All right, is the applicant here? Uh, yes, um, Madam Chair and commissioners, thanks for entertaining this uh, this request. I. I think uh, there's really nothing I can add to Amanda's uh, thorough review. Will you will you say your name for us though, sir? Yeah, it's Prescott Muir. Okay, thank you, Prescott. Um, so there's really nothing else I could add. I'm just happy to answer any re uh, any questions that you might have. <clears throat> okay, uh, staff or uh, commission, any questions for Mr. Muir? All right, um, with that, we'll move on to the next portion. I'm getting a feedback somewhere. Uh, sorry, that was a weird feedback. Um, we'll move on to the public hearing portion then. Um, John, any, I can't really tell if there's any hands up or if anybody from the community council is here. Um, there are currently no hands up and, I, and we can verify with Molly, but I don't think we got any emails on this either. Um, I did notice that there were two additional comments that were added um, today or yesterday. Any, there's no nothing else from that. There's two email comments in your Dropbox, but no additional emails have been received uh, about this one today. Okay. Okay, going, going. It's gone. I'll close the public hearing um, and bring it back to the commission. Um, any questions or comments, or if somebody is willing to make a motion? If there are no comments, I'm willing to make a motion. Okay, I don't hear anybody um, making any inquiries, so please go ahead. All right, based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the conditional use request. PLN PCM 2020-00, sorry, 00944 as proposed, subject to complying with the conditions listed in the staff report. Any second? I'll second that. Thank you. All right, I have a motion by Adrian and a second by Carolyn. Let's go down the list. Maureen? Yes. Adrian? Yes. Carolyn? Agree. John? Yes. Matt? Yes. Sarah? Yes. And Crystal? Yes. All right, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I like taking charge of these really easy agenda items. I could go for that. Um, I believe Brenda can come back in now if she wants to close the meeting altogether. 
Yeah, I was just, uh, I, uh, um, can everybody hear me? Sorry. Yes. So, uh, so if there are no more comments or uh, um, issues, then I think we stand adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, all. Thank you.